if she could make this tiny adjustment. This tiny adjustment, it resolves an inversion. So if, the, if the, this wrist is above this knuckle, they're upside down. Like the hand functions best when this knuckle is above the wrist. And now they reverse their positions. They, 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 they reverse their functions. This wrist is trying to be this guy, and this guy is trying to relax the way the wrist should. So it's, in, it's in inverted. It's an inversion. And then, oh, oh, I resolve the inversion. <sighs> Everything lets go. But no, don't try to build the arch. It's impossible. You have to be practical. But there is a way to to sort of, the arch building function is still there, is still present, and it's just a tiny, tiny bit of, just the tiniest amount. So you may, you may want to get it by actually, take your octave and then, I'll do it here, take your octave and then just let the heel gently, gently, gently smash the keys down. So I'll take it at a, a tenth like that. Yeah? So that's your octave. This is my tenth. So our hands are functioning similar now. And if you just let the, all of a sudden, all the struggle to maintain this structure, I gotta keep the structure, I gotta keep the structure. Oh, the keyboard is supporting me. It's like mommy's got the baby. <laughs> mommy's not gonna let the baby drop, yeah? All of a sudden, the structure knows itself. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, I am a structure, and I can be this structure without so much effort needed to maintain it. And then the nervous system remembers that, and then you're playing away, and somehow it remembers that feeling of being a structure and adapts it to, to, to playing some octaves. And somehow you're a little closer to this instead of this. If you can do this one without, and stay loose and stay agile, then good. But if you go here and try this, ah, oh, let the heel of the hand sink into the white keys and just let go totally. And then, oh, all of a sudden, there's a picture here. And the picture is clear because there's less muscular interference. Like muscular contractions is like static in the system. Now, oh, you lie down, let it all go. Oh, there's that bone, this bone, this bone, this bone, this bone. Oh, all these bones. Oh, it's a nice structure. Wow. How can I use that? And the brain starts coming up with new, new possibilities for using it. So, uh, there's, a, there's a chapter in the craft of piano playing called, and that, that one's translated in German. Well, you can read it in English anyway, but it's, it's called Pian der Leichtigkeit, something or other like that. And there's a chapter called Big Sound from a Small Hand where we do this, this, this thing about, about, about you know, play, an, play an interval, play a large interval, and then just melt the hand so that the, the finger, the underside of the finger is like sunk into the key, and that finger, and this finger, and then the palm, and even the heel, and ah, let it all go. And then when it really melts, like an amoeba, then then the body lets go, but interestingly enough, the hand lets go so much that sometimes you'll see the hand actually gets bigger. Because the hand's trying to go into extension, but it's straining to go into extension. All of a sudden, the muscles let go. It goes into extension without all that muscular effort. It's just like, oh, oh, and it actually, it stays larger than it was. So it's an alternate way of, of actually enlarging your hand or making your hand feel less like a small hand. Uh, and it's an alternate way to what some people do, which is like, oh, let's stretch this, let's stretch this, let's stretch that. If you do this gently and in an exploratory way, this is also very good. But this is, not so, this is more like a stretching yoga kind of thing, not so much a piano somatics kind of thing. But all these strategies are good if they're employed intelligently, yeah? But that's a very, very good question, because this, this small hand and what people do to adapt and what they could do to adapt the size of their hand to the key if they were thinking in this skeletal structure function kind of universe. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? 
Yeah, so, you know, try it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, oh, yeah, and the other thing... Uh... This is Scriabin Opus 42, number 5. And, and then... That, uh, so in the craft of piano playing, I should talk about that one too. So it's, I call it inflected legato. So you play the octave here, and then if you play it like this, then each one is a separate musical event because each one was a separate physical event. But if you go like here, you hang on to these chords, hang on to these tones, hang on to these cones, and move your arm over here, and look. I'm already almost at the C sharp, so... So actually, you can almost join them with your arm. And then... So the arm, instead of going ah, 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 goes da, da. Da, da. People talk about circles. For me, it's not really a circle. It's a flat and then an oval, and a flat and an oval. And amazingly enough, when you do it like that, you never miss. Again, it's like it's way more accurate. There's too much possibility for missing when you do it like this. Some people do it the other way. That gives a different musical result. One's darker and more growling, one's more dynamic and kind of menacing. You know, so, uh, clangers. Uh. I can't do it the whole thing because my, my, I have a bum hand here, but this one is. Uh, you see, the going, just changing the direction of that oval totally changes the sound. Yeah? It's so interesting. The, the second one, this one is darker and somehow more orchestral. And this one is more... It's more direct. And... <laughs> so, you know, there are many artistic choices to be made. And when we have this, this repertoire, repertoire of movements, repertoire of choreographies, then that vastly enlarges the number of choices we have in terms of aesthetics. It, it opens up a whole new world of coloration and character and emotional tone and subtle nuance. My teacher, Phil Cohen, in Montreal, he called it expressively directed microtiming. Expressively directed microtiming. So microtiming means like a thousandth of a second sooner or a thousandth of a second later. And just hmm, that little tiny change creates a different emotional experience or a different, you know, you know this is, as when I'm talking, little tiny inflections in my voice create different emotional notes. It's not like I poke this emotion in the eye, like you're going you're gonna to understand that I'm sad. You're going to understand that. No, it's all subtle. That's what the great elocutionist does, right? So if I'm doing this, that world of expressively directive microtiming is not open to me. I'm locked into this relatively simplistic physical inflection, physical uh, strategy. Yeah? And here, did you see, I, did, I just did that movement six times or eight times, and each one of them was timed differently. And something's happening. And there the other. I can play around with it because I'm in a free, freely looping choreography where there's no blocks, there's no stops. And then I can subtly adjust. It's like driving a race car. A little on the accelerator, a little on the brake, a little bit. Tiny, tiny. You need lots of leeway for subtle nuance to be deeply expressive and not this kind of maudlin, oh, I'm so expressive. Which I believe that the, you know, when they have the expressive look on their face, <laughs> that they're, 
they're listening to what they think they're doing. And like I wrote, I wrote a chapter about it in this book actually, because you look at Horowitz or Rubinstein or someone, and they they have this mask. It's like the face is like a mask, but it's not like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's no, it's not like, I'm listening. I'm listening, and like, it's all listening. <laughs> You, you don't have time to appreciate how beautiful it is. No, because you're listening. And you're there and you're experiencing it. And the audience, they're the ones that, oh, it's so beautiful. Your job is to create this experience and to have this experience, not to appreciate it. <laughs> So I feel, I feel that when you're in this, like what I was just doing now, this kind of subtle choreography, like each time a little different, to figure out like, what's he saying? Where's the danger aspect? Where's the lyrical aspect? Where's the, what's he suggesting? I'm so, I'm so much in this world of creating what's going on and being with it and fooling around with it and experiencing it. I don't have time to like, understand how beautiful it is. It's just like, no. If I'm understanding, I'm, to my mind, if I'm understanding, oh, I'm seeing how beautiful it is, I'm, I'm not the, I'm the audience. And that means that the, the pianist who should be doing this is absent from his job. <laughs> so his, his fingers are doing it and he's, no, like, be in. Uh, and so, yeah, and so this is the danger of, of piano somatics and this whole physical approach is that, and this happened, my teacher in Montreal, Phil Cohen, he was a student of Yvonne Hubert, who was a student of Alfred Cortot. So a lot of this comes from Cortot. The Cortot was a classic, the arm inflects the phrase rather than the arm helps produce a tone. Yeah, and you hear it in his playing. And Phil was like hyper obsessed with moving your arm and having a hand with this, all the stuff I'm showing you today. Some of which I learned from my other teacher, Kemal Gekic, who uh, a Croatian guy who, with whom I studied in Yugoslavia, but much of it is from Phil. And I noticed that Phil's students tended to, to be so into the physical that their performances were beautiful and variegated, like multi-leveled and boring. So they failed, they got obsessed with the physical so much that they were experiencing the physical instead of experiencing the musical. So that's the danger. Everything I'm teaching here is that you, you get so much in the, and many times in the past three days that they, I have my student do something new and, the, and then it's, oh, did you hear how the sound is changing? And they, no. <laughs> Why not? Because I was completely paying attention to my physical. Okay, it's the first time you can be forgiven for that. But eventually, yes, experience the physical, but link it to the ear, link it to the emotions. That's the goal. So there is a danger that, that if I get into this physical choreography thing, that I just stay there. But the, the opportunity is to link these choreographies to musical inflection, musical character, and musical emotion. Yeah? Make sense? Any other questions? So this is the last of my three lectures here. Thank you for being my audience. And uh, I hope it was interesting. And of course, uh, I have my card here, you're welcome to, I think many of you have my email already, but you're welcome to you know, get in touch to ask me questions if you watch these videos afterwards and you have any, something comes up, you need clarification, or I'm always very happy to discuss these things. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with it all, yeah, and especially fascinated with the, the musical flowering that happens when you use these physical strategies to make the piano really sound all in all of its wonderful orchestral glory. Yeah. Cool. So now, we're going to take a couple of minutes break and then we're going to have some individual lessons. Uh, like, nobody's here, so Lenny's going to play first. Do you want to play again? Maybe just a little bit. Yeah, maybe just, we're not going to have full lessons. No. But, but like, if nobody's around, you, you, maybe you could play something if you wanted to. Only if you left the door, I guess. <laughs> <'Cause>, um... <laughs> no, not like
like that then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. We'll lock the door. Sure. Why not? <laughs> Great.